I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. Uh, Gospel of Luke chapter 5. We're uh, continuing our series called Just Jesus. We're looking at the Gospel of Luke. We want to see what uh, Jesus' life was like, what he did, what he taught, who he is, so that we can follow Jesus with our lives. And uh, specifically right now, we are looking at some of the passages that share some of these life-changing encounters with Jesus. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, then uh, grab one of the pew Bibles that look amazingly like this one. Turn to page 1095, and you will find the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible and you need one, then this is a gift for you. Just take one of these. We'd love for you to have it. Uh, We don't want you to read the Word of God because we know if you do, it will change your life. Hey, while you're finding Luke chapter 5, what is the most disgusting experience you've ever had? The the grossest thing you've ever done? One of those ooh, ick moments in your life where you're just like, that is nasty wrong. I don't want you to tell me, but I do want you to tell the person sitting next to you. uh, Take a few moments and do that starting now. Be gross. It's amazing to me how much fun we have with grossness. I I think this is like the favorite question I've ever asked the church. Every service just went nuts. And and I realize that there are some people present who have an advantage in the storytelling, right? Because if you're a if you're a firefighter or paramedic or a nurse or a CNA or a doctor or maybe a mortician uh, or a plumber, then your stories are going to win, right? I mean, because you've, you've got the grossest jobs uh, involved in that. But, you know, for me, I've, I've cleaned public restrooms. Uh, that wasn't exactly pleasant. But the grossest job I had, uh, it may sound, you know, it's a little strange, was driving a school bus. You think, well, driving a school bus isn't gross. No, driving it's not. But when you're carrying a bunch of kids and invariably on a regular basis, one of them comes up to you and stands right next to you and goes, Mr. Bus Driver, I don't feel so... <laughs> And all the kids go to the back of the bus and hang their heads out the windows, you know, so they can breathe, and you're right there with it on you or by you uh, until you're done. So, uh, you know, life can be disgusting. And if you're a parent, you know that, right? Because small children are indiscriminate when where their bodily fluids and substances go. And uh, although I will say this, it seems somehow a little less disgusting if your DNA is involved in those bodily fluids, doesn't it? I mean, then, then, then in other people's kids, I don't know why that is, but it's kind of true. But most of us kind of try to avoid disgusting unless it's our job. You know, it's not something we get up in the morning and go, ooh, I hope something gross happens to me today. Uh, but we try to avoid the, the disgusting things. Jesus didn't. In, in fact, uh, he purposefully, willfully touched one of the most disgusting things in the first century. And that's where our story picks up. Uh, Luke chapter 5, uh, verse 12. Again, if you've got a Bible like mine, page 1095. says, While Jesus was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will. Be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded for a proof to them. But now, even more, the report about Jesus went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Now, we read that, and uh, it doesn't seem disgusting at all to us because uh, we're not necessarily familiar with how they felt in the first century. So allow me to represent a little bit what happened. Uh, this guy, a leper, a person with a skin disease that rotted the flesh, came to Jesus. Now, we, uh, we're not really terrified of leprosy anymore because we know a lot more about it than they did in the first century. 
But for uh, really literally thousands plus years, people were terrified of leprosy. Uh, they didn't understand causes, but they could see effects. And leprosy was one of those things that, like today, would be like Ebola. You know, if somebody walked in here and said, I have, you know, the Ebola virus, you know, we'd all be like, Psh, gone. <laughs> and that's how lepers were, because people would see that their flesh was rotting off and they would freak out. And, and lepers were not allowed to be in contact with people. They, they were not allowed to be around people. They were the official outcasts of the ancient world. And, and so this, this leper was, was taking a risk by being in the city where Jesus was. He wasn't allowed to be in the city. And the fact, lepers were supposed to stand at a distance and warn people that they were there. And he came up to Jesus. And, and, uh, and so that was something that wasn't supposed to happen. In fact, if, uh, if you want to read the, the source material in the Old Testament about leprosy, Leviticus chapters 13 and 14 have the process by which a leper is determined and, and uh, they have to go through all these tests with the priests and things. And then if they are found to be uh, leprous, they are kicked out of the community. They, they are ostracized. They are the official outcast, legally outcast, if you will. And they're not allowed to come back into the community. Not, they're not allowed to see their families. They're not allowed to work. They're not allowed to, to be part of the worship of the community. None of that happens until the priest gives his okay. And again, elaborate tests and sacrifices are required before you can come back in. And, and so only a priest could declare them clean or acceptable. And so they lived as these people who were excluded, who were feared, who were pariahs. And no one would touch a leper. No one would touch a leper because they believed the disease was you know, contagious, extremely contagious. And so they were afraid they might catch it. And in Jewish law, if you touched a leper, you became unclean and you couldn't go worship without making sacrifices and being declared clean again. So what does the Son of God, Jesus, do when this leper comes up to him and asks to be healed? Jesus touches the leper. Now understand, we know by the Gospels that he healed other lepers, healed other people without ever touching them. He just spoke a word. So he did not have to touch the leper, but he wanted us to learn something from this. And he put his hands on this man and he healed him. And, and I love the fact <laughs> that Jesus broke the rules. Okay, now understand, when he broke the rules, he broke in men's rules, saying, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, or else you'll be unclean, you can't do all these kinds of things. And, and Jesus knew that, and, and, but he kind of broke the rules. But then, unless you find that too encouraging, uh, like I do, you know, as a rebellious rule breaker, uh, then he told the man to follow the rules so he could be restored to his family and to his life. Because he told him, go show yourself to the priest. And then when the priest says, okay, you're clean, then you make sacrifices, and then you go back to the priest, and then he says you can go home. And so what was happening was Jesus healed the leper's body, and he restored his life. Jesus healed the leper's body and restored his life. He wanted this man to have his life back, and so he touched the leper, the untouchable, and changed his life. Now, when I look at this story, there's a lot of things that jump out, and I'm going to talk about these. In this context, first of all, some of us in here can identify with the leper. Ah, no, we don't have some nasty you know, disease that, that people don't want to be around us, but, but we've been the outcast. We've been the people who carried the shame uh, so that we were excluded by the community. Maybe you felt the loathing of the crowds, the judgment of other people. Maybe even been, they've been afraid of you. And, and maybe you're still living today the label that somebody else attached to you and you've owned. Maybe you're not called a leper, but maybe you see yourself as an addict or a slacker. Or maybe an adulterer or a liar. Maybe you think of yourself as a hypocrite or a murderer or a thief or a cheat or a failure or a loser. Whatever label you're living with, whatever failures or rebellions or mistakes in your life, I want you to know today that Jesus is not repulsed by your condition. Jesus is not repulsed by our condition. It's, it's not something that grosses him out. Uh, see, we see that in the story, but we also see it in the bigger picture of the Bible that Jesus stepped into our world to pay for our sins, to rescue us from hell. And he did that literally by taking our 
sin, our filth off of us and putting it on himself. That's what he was doing on the cross. You know, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote it this way. He said, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. And so Jesus took all of our filth on himself and he bore it on the cross and he gave us his goodness, his righteousness. That's the exchange that happened. That's what Jesus was doing when he died. He paid the price for our sins so that we can be forgiven, so that we can be healed. I mean, literally, we were spiritual lepers, outcasts, and Jesus touched us and embraced us and made us his. He's not repulsed by our condition, and yet so many times we think God's angry at us, right? You ever felt that way? You just like totally screwed up and you think God's really angry at me now? You ever hear people say stuff like, well, I can't go to church, the roof would fall in, right? You guys heard people say that? Okay, let's just confess. How many of you said that at some point in your life? <laughs> yeah, see, a lot of hands go up, every service. Because we think, ah, there's no way God wants me. But here's the thing, God's not angry with you. Yes, God hates sin. The Bible affirms that God hates sin. Why does God hate sin? He's holy, he's pure, he's sinless. But here's the why he really hates sin. God hates sin for the damage that it does to the people that he loves. God hates our sin because it is damaging our lives. You see, the big picture, God created this perfect world. That's what the book of Genesis talks about. God made this world perfect, and he put us in it, and he wanted to bless us, and we messed it up with our rebellion. We decided we could live it our way instead of God's way. Well, I know you and I didn't, but our ancestors did, and guess what? We've done exactly the same thing that they did. We followed in our family's footsteps of rebellion. And and because of that, we have brought sin into the world and through sin, death into the world. Again, the Apostle Paul says, For just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all people because all sinned. So here's what happens. God deeply desires to bless us. And yet every time we choose our way instead of God's way, it results in pain and destruction and death for us. Every time. And God grieves. God grieves our self-inflicted wounds. God grieves our self-centered, hate-filled, violence-addicted world. That's why he sent Jesus to die for us, to pay for our sins. That, that's why he promises a new body for us, one that's untainted by death. That's why he's going to recreate this world, give us a new world, to forever rid it of the stain and destruction of sin, of rebellion, of defiance. So please know today, God is not angry with you. He despises the damage that sin has done to your life. And here's the good news. Jesus will restore your life if you ask. He will restore your life if you ask. Look again at the very first verse. I love this. This is so simple and yet so profound. Uh, Verse 12. While Jesus was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus restored his life. Completely. His body was healed. He got to go back to his family. He got to go back to work. All the relationships that he had were redeemed. And he got to worship with his people once again. So please understand, God will restore your life if you ask him to. If you ask him to. Now, here's what God won't do. God will not rescue you from your problems. Because a lot of times, that's what we want, right? We go, God, I'm in trouble and I need you and I want you to do this for me. I want you to kind of fix this. And, and here's the thing. God wants to change your life. He doesn't necessarily want to change your circumstances. See, but a lot of times we're like, God, if you could just like make everything the way I want it and leave me alone, we're good with it. That's what we want. You know, kind of like our marriage is struggling. So we go, God, would you please fix my spouse? Right? God, change my wife. She's just not doing what I want her to do. God, 
change my husband. He's, you know, he's not, and, and, and he's not going to do that. He's not going to change your spouse. He's not going to change your kids. He's not going to make your boss suddenly intelligent. He's not going to like clean up your legal mess. He's going to change you. And see, we get so focused. Sometimes we go, God, we want, we want you to heal our bodies. And what he wants to do is restore our lives. See, we ask God to fix our problems when he wants to alter our hearts and our attitudes and our vision. So let me put it this way. It, the reality is Jesus doesn't want to fix your life. He wants to lead your life. He wants to lead your life. You see, we, we get so caught up that we want to escape the pain of the moment. But God wants to teach us how to live so that we can build joyful moments into the fabric of our lives. So that our lives are built on his word. That's why we want you to read the Bible. And, and so that the blessings flow as a natural outcome rather than just calling out God to throw us a life raft or a life preserver. See, Jesus didn't come to save the day, but to save our lives for all eternity. To change us. Jesus healed the leper's body and restored his life. I want you to know that, and I want you to know he'll do the same for you if you ask. He will restore your life. Have you asked him to do that? Are you in that process of letting him change you into a life of joy? Second thing I want us to see out of this story is that followers of Jesus are people of compassion. The compassion of Jesus is overwhelmingly evident in this text. The way he treats the outcast, the way he touches the unclean. And if you are a follower of Jesus, and by that I mean that you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of this world. You believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins. And he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Then Jesus sends us to touch the untouchable. That's what he wants us to do. And we know this because Jesus set the example with this leper. And throughout the Gospels, when we read the, you know, I challenge you to read the Gospel of Luke. You read the Gospel of Luke, you see Jesus does it over and over and over again. He, he cares for people. And, and not only that, but he tells us to love our neighbor as ourself. Be people of compassion. The Apostle Paul just took Jesus' example in words and, and put it this way to the church at Ephesus. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Be kind and compassionate. That means if we are going to represent Jesus as a church and as individuals, we have to care. We care. Hey, what's the opposite of love? Yeah, see, we, we always think that. That's the easy answer. Because you love or hate, but... You know, love and hate are kind of two sides of the same coin. There's a lot of passion involved. There's usually an individual involved. There's, there, there's somebody else that's part of that equation, and, and, and there's a lot of energy focused on them. But I, I heard one time it put this way. Maybe the opposite of love isn't hate. Maybe the opposite of love really truly is apathy. Because love cares. And apathy, I don't care. I don't care about you. I don't care about your pain. I don't care about your heartache. I don't care about your struggles. I don't care. I only care about me. I'm only concerned with my pain and my struggles and my wants and my desires. And you don't matter. I don't care. And a lot of times apathy blinds us to the hurt around us. Because love cares for the hurting and the broken. Uh, so we, as followers of Christ, care for the outcasts, what the Bible calls the least of these. And to do that, we have to see them. We have to see them. Remember, apathy blinds us to the needs of others. We have to see them. Matthew chapter 25, uh, Jesus tells three parables. They're parables of judgment, parables of warning, really. And, and the last one is called Parable of the Sheep and the Goats. I uh, encourage you to read this uh, sometime. But, but he, he kind of summarizes it this way. Uh, Jesus said, look, at a time of judgment, Son of Man's going to come, and he's going to bring all of the nations before him. He's going to separate them out, sheep and the goats, sheep on his right, goats on his left. And then the king is going to say to those on his right, come you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from before the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was sick and you came to me. I was in prison and you visited me. 
And, and the righteous will answer and say to him, Lord, um, when did we see you? When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you naked and clothe you or a stranger and invite you in? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Inasmuch as you did this to the least of these brothers of mine, you did it to me. Oh. And then the king will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you evil ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I, I was naked, and you did not clothe me. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me. And I was sick and in prison, and you did not come to me. And they, too, will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you? When, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked or a stranger or sick and in prison and not minister to you? And the king will answer them and say, Inasmuch as you did not do this to the least of these brothers of mine, you did not do it to me. And these will depart into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Have you ever asked God to open your eyes so that you could see the outcast? Or is it just focused on your concerns? First, we have to see them, and then we have to embrace them, touch them with our lives. Because so often what happens, and, and I've seen this, you've seen this, is we see them, and instead of being moved to compassion, we're disgusted. Would you look at that? No. Can you believe that? No, we, just, we don't offer compassion. We just judge them. And, and let me just be brutally honest. Historically, the church has been better at casting people out than embracing outcasts. You know, and some of you have felt that sting in your life. There were times when people, you know, excluded you or, or treated you like an outcast because of failure in your life because you didn't live up to their standards. And you know the pain I'm talking about. We tend to avoid the lepers rather than touching them. And if there's lepers around, then you know, you know what we tend to do as a church? So it looks compassionate, but it's really not. We put together a committee and then we build them a nice leper colony someplace else. Right? Because, wow, we built them a leper colony so they can go live there so we don't have to see them, so we don't have to touch them. It's time that we repent. See, compassion begins when we care. It's a care we have to see. But compassion only means something when we act. When we act. You know, good intentions with no actions are worthless. If I tell you that I want to lose weight, you know, it's New Year, I'm going to lose weight. Everybody, everybody wants to lose weight, right? But if I tell you I want to lose weight while I'm eating a pint of haagen chocolate peanut butter ice cream, <laughs> is there any real credibility to that? If I tell you I want to get healthy, you know, because my doctors told me I need to get healthy while I'm having a couple of double cheeseburgers with fries and a shake, uh, is there any credibility to, you know, I'm, what I'm talking No. And if we say that we are compassionate, that we care, but we don't act on that, what are we? Just hypocrites and liars. So we must act. We must act as individuals. We must act as a church. As individuals, we need to see people that are hurting and bless them. We need to see the broken around us and embrace them, welcome them, sacrifice for them. Um, I'm on Facebook, and I'm, I'm friends with a lot of you. I'll, if you friend me, I'll, 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 and you're a part of Calvary, I'll, I'll friend you back. But then that means that I see what's going on in your life sometimes. <laughs> good and bad. But, but this was good this week. I, I happened to catch this uh, post on, on one of our family members here at Calvary. It's a single mom uh, with kids. And, and one of her kid's friends, who also has a single parent family, uh, lost her jacket. And it's cold and didn't have a jacket. They didn't have money to get one. This family just went and got them a jacket, took it to them. And I went, that's compassion. That's acting on that need. You saw the need. You met the need. That's awesome. All of us can do things like that. And, and as a church, we, well, you guys are being uh, compassionate in a lot of ways, whether you realize it or not. Let me just tell you about some of the things you have done as Calvary. Uh, toward the least of these in Lake Havasu City. 
You know, every time we do Lord's Supper, we take up a benevolence offering, and, and a lot of you just drop a few dollars in there, and, and you maybe you wonder, what does that actually go to, and how much do we actually give? Because of you and your generosity, last year, we gave away $58,757 to people who are hurting and in need that we call our benevolence ministry. Isn't that cool? Yeah. In other words... We helped feed people and clothe people and, and fuel their cars and keep their lights on at their house or fix their cars or help them get prescription meds, pay the rent, uh, all those kinds of things. Plus, we, you guys gave away over 300 gift bags to, on the Wallapai Reservation and down in Mexico to kids who, who wouldn't have had a good Christmas without you. Plus, you fed the teachers and did a lot of other things for this community. But here's something you probably didn't know. Uh, while we've been building Sweetwater uh, Worship Center, you know, which we hope that we'll get in really, really soon... Uh, but while we've been building that, a lot of focus on that, what you probably didn't know is that we helped to build two other churches in this world. In Albania and in Bulgaria, there are people who are worshiping uh, today in buildings that you helped to provide. And, and see, those kinds of things it is a great start. This is action. But let's also be honest about that. Sometimes it's really tempting to just write a check instead of show compassion ourselves. It's really tempting, and, and you know, generosity is a great thing, but it doesn't stop there. We need to act. So as a church, we, we decided we're, we're going to help us be obedient to Christ in this way. And so a few months ago, we launched our ministry called Serve. And we ask you guys to fill out a, a form, a card, uh, or go online and do that. that kind of just says, hey, here's who I am, and here's how I'd like to help people in this community or in this church. Here's what I want to offer up. Here's how much time I have. Here's my interests and my abilities. And a lot of you filled those out. A lot of you didn't, but a lot of you did. And, and it's not too late. You can go to the website, calvarylhc.com, click on the Serve tab, and you can fill out the online form to be part of the Serve ministry. And because we want to help us serve our community. We want to help us show compassion to our community so they can understand that God's not angry at them, but he loves them. And in fact, over the next few weeks and months, we're going to be having uh, community organizations be here that we partner with so that we can help them demonstrate compassion to the broken and hurting of Lake Havasu City. Today, this weekend, we have with us from Interagency the Big Brothers Big Sisters program. There's a table outside, and if you're interested in being a big brother, big sister, then you can stop by that table after the service, and you can get the process started because it's not instantaneous. But uh, uh, here's what that involves. That involves you caring about kids that need some positive influence in their lives, and you want to do something about that. And see, they came to us and said, hey, would you guys be willing to be part of this? Because we want people who have a positive influence on kids' lives and hopefully can make a difference, not just temporarily, but for all eternity. I, I think that's amazingly cool. They want to involve churches in being big brothers, big sisters. Now, here's the thing. If you care about kids, you qualify. If you're a positive person, you qualify. Now, if you're a grump, you don't qualify. <laughs> I'm just telling you right now, if you're one of these people that's all negative, you're going to get some kid, and you're going to be like, all right, kid, the world sucks, and it's a terrible place, and it's only going to get worse. I, and, you know, we don't need you depressing children, all right? <laughs> we have other places you can serve or, you know, write a check. Um, but uh, <laughs> let's just... Some people are better at compassion than others, right? So if you can do that, and if you can pass a background check, which is a lot like, you know, if you come to Calvary and want to work with kids, you got to pass a background check. Same is true with the community organizations. So if you can do those things, and you've got four hours a month for one year to invest in a child's life, you can make a difference. So stop by the table, check it out, because some of you, as I'm describing this, the Spirit is nudging you. And he's just saying, you can do this. This is in your sweet spot. You have the time. You can make the time. You can do that. Others of you are saying, that, that's not for me. That's okay. What is the Spirit prompting you to do to be a person of compassion? How are you going to show that you care to the hurting, to the broken, to the untouchables, to the outcasts? Because here's what we know. Jesus touched the leper. Restored his life. Jesus has embraced us who were spiritual lepers and has changed our lives. And he's called us to be people of compassion. So how are you going to respond 
to the outcasts. How is anyone going to know that you care and that Jesus cares? Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. We don't deserve it, but you loved us anyway, and you've blessed us incredibly. And today, Lord, we thank you for the life you've given us in Jesus. Thank you that you're not angry at us, but you want to redeem us, restore us, heal us. So, Father, this morning we come and we give you our lives and we pray that you would teach us how to care. You'd open our eyes to see those around us who are hurting and broken. And, God, you'd give us the courage to act because you acted in Jesus for us. And his sacrifice changed our lives and our destinies forever. And for that we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God.